Hi, my name is Martin Kering. I'm the head of Economist Impact's World Ocean Initiative, which imagines an ocean in robust health and with a vital economy. World Ocean Summit and our Inside Our webinar series are an integral part of the work we do on accelerating a sustainable ocean economy. You can find out more about the initiative's work, including coverage of key themes discussed during the webinars, on our website ocean.economist.com. Welcome to today's discussion on enhancing stewardship for the safe, sustainable use of the ocean, sponsored by Lloyd's Register Foundation. The ocean has produced 2.5 trillion US dollars annually in goods and services in recent years, and its asset value is estimated at 24 trillion US dollars. It's also the world's largest carbon sink and plays a vital role in limiting global warming. But the ocean's vital resources remain dangerously exploited and also poorly understood. Um, so ocean health continues to deteriorate as a result of climate change, pollution, poor resource management, issues that were also discussed at the uh, COP26 conference. Um, the cost of climate impacts on the ocean could exceed 300 billion US dollars a year by 2050 as a result of sea level rise, storms, losses in fisheries, tourism, and also ocean carbon absorption. Therefore, careful stewardship is needed to manage ocean resources safely and sustainably. This webinar, therefore, will explore the importance of effective ocean engineering for the safe and sustainable use of marine resources and will help us to highlight some of the challenges, the risks, and also the opportunities as ocean-based industries continue to expand. So in terms of the key talking points for today's session, we want to look at the trends, the predictions uh, for ocean-based activities and the evolving social views of the state of the ocean as well, how ocean engineering and future ocean structures can play a part in the safe, uh, sustainable use of the ocean, and how ocean citizens uh, can raise public awareness and engagement in restoring ocean health. And we also have a couple of audience questions that you have sent in, and thank you very much, for everyone, for sending those questions in, and hopefully we'll get to, to some of those as well. So just in terms of um, the bigger picture, so th this discussion today is part of a series of events in the run-up to the World Ocean Summit Asia-Pacific, which will take place virtually from December the 6th to December the 10th this year, and the World Ocean Summit 2022 in Lisbon from March the 1st to March the 3rd next year. Both events are free to attend, and you will see the link to register for the World Ocean Summit Asia-Pacific uh, on this platform. We have an audience poll as well running during the, uh, today's webinar, so please click on the audience poll tab to register your answers to our questions. I'm joined today by four excellent and very experienced panelists. So first of all, we have Ruth Bumfrey. She's Director of Research and Strategic Projects at the Lloyd's Register Foundation. Then we have Donette Streets. She's Director at the Frontiers Department at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of uh, Guyana. And then we have Michael Bruno. He's provost at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and author of The Urban Ocean. And last but not least, uh, Ruben Eiras. He's secretary general at Forum Ocean. You will find the full biographies of our panelists uh, on the screen under this media player. And there are also a few additional resources there, links to relevant articles on ocean stewardship from the World Ocean Initiative. I would like to once again take this opportunity to thank Lloyd's Register Foundation for their support uh, of this event. So let's uh, delve right in, uh, into it. So, I mean, first of all, just I wanted to say um, thanks a lot to our panelists, but also uh, just in terms of how we want to structure the conversation. So first, I'd like to ask a couple of questions on the key trends in ocean uses that we are seeing, and then uh, delving more into kind of the better, better stewardship of our ocean. What does that mean? How do we turn kind of ideas for better ocean stewardship into actionable, practical next steps? And then talking a little bit about kind of collaborations for better ocean engineering and then getting to those audience questions that you have sent in. So without further ado, let's uh, start uh, with the key trends in ocean uses. So first of all, uh, Ruth, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, you look after a large portfolio of ocean related grants, charitable activities and innovation activities at, at the Lloyd's Register Foundation. How do you see our uses of the ocean evolving over the next decade or two? What key trends will emerge? Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I'm, I'm so delighted to be here and talking about a subject which is so close to our hearts, all of our hearts. So, so looking ahead, you know, you've talked about some of the economic growth that's happening around the oceans. And if we take a step away from our planet and look at it, um, you know, as the 
first astronauts saw it, we see a blue planet. It's a planet 70% covered in, in, in water. It's a, it's a planet that's connected by water. And yet so much of our thinking and our economic activity is focused on land. So I think the, key, the uh, an overarching key trend is the visibility of the things that will happen in our oceans. And that will be um, uh, supported by all sorts of uh, discovery tools, indexes, um, by the growth of satellites and different technologies that will help us to discover and understand our oceans better. So um, underneath that, of course, is the gro growth in the ocean economy. Now, if you think about the ocean economy, you might be thinking about fisheries, about shipping, ports, pipelines, construction, offshore wind and the oil and gas. But also, you know, we're, we're also thinking about the new economy of natural capital. How do we start to measure the capital of the ocean? How do we start to um, protect it, protect our ecosystems and weave that story into the economy, into our economic valuation, our economic investments of the ocean. And so alongside that will go all sorts of financial investments and different trends in financial investments that will help us to um, grow our ocean economy in both ways, both in the natural capital and industrial capital. The third, uh, a third area of, of trend is just thinking about our population. So if we're looking at a population growth for our planet to almost 10 billion by 2050, we have to look at where those people will be and, and where the population of the world will be in 2050. And they'll be um, very much um, centered in South, Southeast Asia, which is already growing very fast, but also looking to Africa and, and then to a lesser extent to South America. But so what are the skills that are going to be needed? What are the industries and the economic activity in the different parts of the world? And how will we upskill people to be able to um, manage that ocean economy in a sustainable and safe way. And, and then finally, thinking about some of the technologies, a lot of our ocean economy right now is in shallow water. Um, we are putting things out into our ocean spaces um, in, in easily accessible areas. We're not doing it in a particularly planned way. And the technology will have to take us deeper and deeper. And it, it will take us deep into the deeper ocean spaces, into ultra deep um, ocean activities. So there'll be a whole load of technological um, advancement that will be needed to better plan that and to do that safely and to do that in a, in a, in a way that's joined up. So it's not done um, like in a wild west, you know, where it just happens, but we, we need to sort of plan that and share data. Thanks, Martin. Thanks a lot, Ruth. And this was really important to highlight, you know, why ocean stewardship is so important. I mean, highlighting this, you know, the visibility, the need to enhance that visibility through research, through tools, but also the natural capital dimension uh, that is often forgotten when we talk about the ocean economy. And you mentioned the skills, needs uh, and the tech advancements required. Um, and I, w I wanted to kind of, um, you know, ask Donette as well in terms of how you see kind of key trends in, in ocean use evolve. I mean, you are an experienced Diplomats specialized in border issues and international maritime law. From your experience, how would you describe the relationship of coastal developing countries with the ocean? Well, first of all, um, thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for um, for invi inviting me to be a part of this uh, critical discussion. And I, I want to begin by saying to you um, that First of all, many developing countries have a, a completely marine-based economy. And, and the, the marine economy is, 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 is very, very indispensable, I would say, to the very survival of the state. So if the, the marine economy, if the marine, it is not completely, if the economy of some states is not completely marine-based, for others, the marine economy is a significant percentage of the economy. And so, a lot on economic relating to ocean resources and their utilization. And so now, for those countries, the challenge is how do we develop a more coherent, integrated, and structured framework? A framework that will allow us to manage um, our ocean resources but it will also have to take into account the economic potential of our the natural marine resources. Those, um, the framework will have to also take into account the need for development and the international commitments, I'd say, of those developing states with respect to, 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 to stewardship 
of, of, of the ocean. So that is what I think we can say is the trend with respect to developing countries are seeing their um, economic resources, their, their use and stewardship of the ocean, I think. And those are all of the very critical areas that we have to take into account when we talk about the issue of ocean governance and management and so on. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Donette. And uh, this is really critical to highlight that uh, for for uh, many developing countries, the marine economy is really crucial in terms of you know making the most of its you know economic potential and having a coherent framework, as you mentioned, uh, for for you know sustainable and safe use of ocean resources is is really crucial. And I wanted to go to you, Michael, and now in terms of you know in your research and publications, for example, the the urban ocean, you explore how the coastal ocean impacts humans and in turn also how human activities impact the health and dynamics of the coastal ocean. So what in your opinion is driving the heightened awareness of and also the concern for the relationship between human populations and the ocean? Well, thank you, Martin, and it's great to be here with you and my colleagues. Um, simply put, there are more people living, working and playing along the coastal ocean than ever before. Uh, to put this in perspective, 30 years ago, there were 10 megacities in the world, defined as cities having a population of at least 10 million people. Today, there are 37 megacities in the world. 24 of that 37 are located along the coastal ocean. So what that does is uh, and you alluded to it in your question. It's a two-way street. So those people are having an outsized influence on the environment of the coastal ocean. In many cases, uh, literally the position of the shoreline and the orientation and configuration of the shoreline. Um, and in turn, the ocean is having a more and more pronounced impact on the lives of those people living along the ocean. Um, we have superimposed on all of this climate change. Uh, the IPCC uh, recent report released in August um, shows really for the first time in a scientific, uh, very rigorous manner, the direct correlation between climate change and the intensity and frequency of major coastal storms. So you have superimposed on a population migration towards the ocean, really because of the opportunities that the ocean presents with the national, natural resources. Um, because of that migration, you have more and more populations exposed to the risks, primarily uh, caused by the long-term impacts of climate change. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Michael. And I mean, you highlighted this, that, you know, the rise of megacities, which is a really crucial part of, uh, of why this interaction between uh, humans and, and coastal oceans is so important. And, and the IPCC report highlighting, you know, the exposure to risks. Um, so, you know, you, we mentioned cities, you mentioned uh, developing countries. And there's, of course, also, you know, the EU is increasingly, uh, you know, developing this kind of a blue economy strategy. And I wanted to go to, to, to you, Ruben. Uh, you know, at the, at the Forum Oceano, uh, given the, you know, this Portuguese blue economy cluster, you work across diverse blue economy sectors, but you also have vast government experience. I mean, having held key positions at the Ministry of the Sea of Portugal and also having worked on many EU projects. So from your experience, what is the main strategic orientation of the EU for promoting a sustainable blue economy? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for, for having me. And also for uh, participating in such, a, in such a distinguished panel. Um, so I would say that you know, trying to simplify uh, what is the main you know, so goal or strategy of the EU is to digitalize, decarbonize, and circularize the blue economy. Of course, circularize is the word that doesn't exist. But here is you now the main focus is to close the loop of the industrial processes. So, uh, and when we look at what has to be done to tackle the climate change uh, challenges, uh, to tackle also the challenges that were mentioned before, 
by the colleagues of my panel, you really have to, in a transversal way, in all sectors, to digitalize, decarbonize, and circularize the processes. This is in the, in the essential what the EU Green Deal is aiming for. In terms of instruments for uh, achieving that, I would um, I would say take uh, I would say the the focus into what the EU taxon. Uh, when you look at this, uh, you know, um, concept, you say, well, that's a Brussels uh, concept, uh, uh, technical jargon, very hermetic. But in fact, it is uh, 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 um, an approach to have a super uh, state uh, approach to offer an ESG framework that can be credible. So it's not perfect. But it will be most probably the best instrument available to avoid blue washing and green washing. And why this is important, and this, I would say, intertwines what I have said before. Because you have to have um, frameworks that are capable of delivering impact measurement that is, uh, can be used by the, by the finance industry to uh, finance the right projects that deliver the right impact. So in this case, uh, when you're talking about, uh, uh, for example, infrastructures or coastal cities, when you look at ports, ports have to be you know, designed in a way that in, they integrate with the natural cap capital functions. Because ports are also, or can be designed as natural capital enhancers, with, for example, artificial reefs uh, and other kinds of, of approaches, but also our climate change resilience infrastructure. So they can protect the coastal cities against uh, climate change uh, uh, phenomena. So this is also leads us, and I will, you know, uh, uh, end my intervention, uh, this first intervention here, to the valuation and valorization of the ecosystem services. So it's very, so the, the ESG frame, framework with the right technology, so the digital technology that can uh, audit the ocean and bring the right information on how the natural assets are performing carbon capture services and, uh, uh, and, and alike is very important in really to accelerate the deployment of technology solutions that then will be financed by the, the, the right uh, stakeholders. Thanks a lot, Ruben. And, yeah, I mean, you highlighted the, this importance of having that framework and the EU with the taxonomy and the Green Deal uh, is, is doing that and then bringing the technology and that could include ports integrating with uh, natural capital, as you mentioned, uh, and making sure that the finance for that is, is, is right, including valuing the ecosystem services provided by those ecosystems. So that, that's really uh, very important. And that, that leads us into this kind of conversation, what, what it really means to create better stewardship of our ocean to you know, make sure that we kind of can harness uh, these opportunities. And I wanted to go back to Ruth on, on that particular topic. I mean, obviously at the at the Lloyd's Register Foundation, you focus on the greatest safety challenges, including safety at sea, of course. How do you help to better protect people and property from harm at sea? Thank you, Martin. Um, well, what I'd like to introduce here is, is a sort of concept around ocean citizenship, which um, not only puts a duty on all of us as, as residents of the blue planet, you know, we're, 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 we're citizens of a blue planet and we all have a responsibility as corporations, as governments, as individuals to that ocean. But also then thinking about those who work and who make their living on the oceans, which I think is, is one of the key parts of the heritage of Lloyd's Register, thinking about those who work at, at sea on ships. But, but, looking at how that, that ocean economy is going to expand and the, the new types of job, the new types of work, which will be at sea, looking at people like fishermen. You know, Danette's talked about the um, some countries, their total economy, near, nearly all of their economy is at sea. You know, it's a maritime economy. And 
many of these jobs, most of these jobs maybe, are high hazard, um, unsafe jobs, which are poorly paid and which are out of sight, out of mind for most of the other citizens of the Blue Planet. So for me, a key part of the stewardship going forward has to be to bring those people working at sea, whether they're on ships or oil rigs or um, other kinds of infrastructure or fishing, providing us food, to bring them in, into, into visibility that they are part of a just transition. As you know, we, we've, we've talked a lot about just transition at COP, but what does that actually mean um, for those who work at sea? And how do we reward and protect those people in a way that is responsible wherever in the world you live. So, so for me, the, the key part of the ocean stewardship is, is those jobs at sea and, and making them safe and sustainable jobs. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ruth. And this is really important to highlight. I mean, starting off with the, with the citizenship conversation, I mean, because it's, it really starts with us being part of this and, and seeing our own uh, relationship with the ocean as being, you know, citizens in a way and and the uh, human dimension is really crucially mentioned the trust transition uh, and the, the livelihoods of of people working in ocean based uh, industries is really crucial you mentioned the need to protect uh, the rights uh, and opportunities for those people and and uh, donet of course you know you are uh, you know you have vast experience when it comes to kind of international maritime law and ocean governance what is your opinion on how to better protect people and property from harm at sea I want to look at it from um, from another angle. I want to look at that issue of protection of people and property uh, from harm at sea, really with some international lens. Now, we have a situation where shipping is a key user uh, of the oceans. And I want to say that the International Maritime Organization is the key U.S responsible for developing and, and adopting measures to improve the safety and security of international shipping. So in that regard, I want to say that safety and security is multifaceted. So the Inter-Maritime Organization has the responsibility not only to deal with the physical aspect of safety and security of people and property from harm at sea, but also, I believe, from the safety and and I see I, I would dare use the word security also of the of the marine environment in which the shipping um, takes place so it is it is really a, a twofold I think uh, uh, kind of task that we have before us in terms of, of you, you protect the environment you protect people's livelihood you protect um, people's lives basically and then there's the physical aspect in terms of security and how we we trade and travel at sea to ensure that crimes at sea um, do not occur, or to the extent that they occur, there are international regulations that are geared towards dealing with that. And so I want to say that, the, in my opinion, one of the answers to that particular question is regulation. Regulation at the international level, whether by the International Maritime Organization, and then once that regulation at the international level, I think there is need for proper implementation of those legislation by international players, um, countries with, with stakes in the, um, with, in the maritime community. And so I say also in that regard that there's need for assistance to developing countries most of the time to implement those international regulations that are developed by the international community. So there's the regulation, there's the implementation, there's the proper implementation of the regulations and the necessary uh, assistance that is ne uh, that would need to go to certain countries to implement those regulations. We have also, the IMO has some very active instruments. I think the majority of, of, of states with maritime interests are, are states parties to the, to the SOLAS Convention, to the... Um, relating to ship and port security. And so I think the implementation of those instruments, those and other instruments, those are just 
um, to name a few. We have also the um, the Marple Convention and the and I think which deals with the pollution uh, from ships, which deals with the issue of pollution from ship and those greenhouse gases. And so I think those are all key instruments. There will be other believe as these issues become more topical and as the international community really rally around, um, I think developing measures to ensure safety and security in whatever way um, that becomes necessary. And there are other conventions. And so those become necessary. They become critical. And so the implementation of those and the assistance to developing countries and those um, to implement Implement conventions, I believe that is very critical, and that is one way I believe that we can deal with the issue of, of, of protecting people and property from harm. Mm -hmm. Thank Great, you. thanks a lot, Annette. And you, you highlighted the multifaceted kind of nature of, of, uh, of the ocean stewardship and particularly the need for regulation, implementation, and then assistance. And as you mentioned, there are lots of IMO instruments that can help uh, in this regard. Um, Michael, I wanted to uh, also draw on your expertise here. I mean, your research and teaching interests focus on, uh, focus on ocean observation systems, on climate change, community resilience. Um, and, you know, from your experience and, and kind of the ocean focus research that you have done, what are your insights into protecting people and property from harm and also improving ocean stewardship? Well, I'll, I'll draw on a, a phrase um, and it's often used in in my in my world, uh, and that is, you cannot ma manage what you cannot measure. And more and more, we are developing uh, sensor technologies, including satellite-based technologies, deep ocean sensors, that are giving us a better and better understanding of what is happening in the ocean. A lot of Uh, what is happening is caused by humans, as we know, short-term influences, impacts like microplastics, um, long-term impacts like climate change. Um, but I'm going to go from there, from that scientific and technology development um, to the communities. Uh, Ruth and Donette have spoken very eloquently, I think, of, of uh, impacts on communities and a focus on communities and um, from my situation here, literally in the, mi the middle of the Pacific, the world's largest ocean, we see and encounter a lot of uh, issues that I would, I would define as equity issues um, related to the communities that are most impacted by the, the sorts of issues we're discussing here today. So in, in uh, Oceania, Uh, we have island states, island nations um, who had no um, no role in uh, the impacts that we're seeing, whether it's plastics pollution or climate change. And yet they are among the first nations, the first peoples to be impacted by things like sea level rise um, and uh, um, coral bleaching uh, impacts related to um, excess carbon in the ocean and uh, rightfully they are saying well we are we are being asked to to migrate we are being asked to to move out of harm's way and for many indigenous populations uh, that is not an option again if we if we focus our work on communities we rapidly learn that the options that the so-called developed world are presenting to these very impacted, mostly small nations, are, are not acceptable to those communities. Um, mm -hmm. Indigenous peoples are often very connected to the land. And, uh, and so they are rightfully saying, well, you're the engineers, you developed the technology, in some cases you messed it up. So how are you going to help us fix our situation and allow us to set, stay in our ancestral homelands. And I think that is a, uh, that's a, a we've, we've reached a tipping point, I think, in terms of how we manage uh, the impacts to communities along the coastal ocean in that regard. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. And, and you highlighted this in the issue of equity here, and uh, you know, indigenous communities often being you know, at the heart of you know the impacts uh, of you know coral bleaching and other impacts that you mentioned. Uh, and this kind of community focus is really something that uh, that, that needs to happen now. Um, I wanted to go to you, Ruben, as well. I mean, uh, also looking at it from the, you know your perspective at, at Forum Oceano. Uh, you know, you're the coordinator for Blue Economy Entrepreneurship Innovation investment financing uh, and, and other areas so you look at the kind of the blue economy kind of from multiple angles what do you say um, are the kind of priorities for protecting people and property from harm at sea so i would say you know that's a very innovative question uh, and the way to, to put you know that, that issue and i will i will answer that uh, in three you know angles so the, the first angle, and going back to my former, interve uh, to my former intervention, is again with the eutaxonomy. So the, the, the main principle of the eutaxonomy is, in fact, the do not significant, significant harm principle. So what does this mean? This means, so the eutaxonomy has six environmental objectives, and the main, uh, you know, uh, direction is that you can't uh, fulfill one of those objectives, make a putting in hazard or doing significant harm to the other five. So there has to be a really a right balance in the way you deploy your solution and the impact that that solution generates. This is quite complex. It seems impossible, but it's not. It's, it, what you have to do is being much more thorough in the analysis of what each process in the value chain generates and then produce the technology and the solution that uh, addresses that. So you have to look to the whole value chain so that and redesign it so that you cannot or so you prevent the most the most possible the harm the harm that can be done at sea at the sea and at the people who who, who use it. second angle is i think you know um, when you look at cop and how uh, you know uh, the objectives are designed and agreed of course it's a very complex multi-party, uh, let's say, uh, agreement. But, uh, you know, really, we have to be more pragmatic in, in, uh, in achieving certain goals. And I, I just, I would say, put for, you know, um, a scenario that be like this. Imagine, so if you take shipping companies, the, the big shipping companies are European and Chinese and Singaporean. Let's just imagine by a moment that European Union and China agreed that the fuel that will be used in the routes between their markets is hydrogen. And that's it. What will happen? This would end the uncertainty that now looms around in the shipping industry saying, what, but I'm going to be green or be greener, but where I'm going to invest in hydrogen, in ammonia, in green methanol, uh, which is the technology to, 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 to go. So this is, you know, we have to bring certainty in the way how, how we're going to achieve those goals. If not, you know, uh, the industry will always, you know, uh, try to, you know, postpone because they do not have full technological answers for it. Because at the end of the day, we need regulation, but we also need the right technology for deploying the solution. But the, the technology will only, of course, uh, be generated if it has the regulation or the agreement between the parties in what is going to be used to deliver that, I will say, impact. And thirdly, into uh, 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 the third angle, is the ESG innovation deal flow. So we have an, uh, at the moment a, a situation 
that you have a lot of money flowing in, in private investment funds and, and, and other areas of finance into uh, the blue innovation technology. But where are the projects and uh, that, where that money is going to be invested? Where is the deal flow for such an, an amount of resources? So uh, an initiative like it was mentioned before, if two economic blocks agree in using a technology that will have a huge impact, will also create the innovation ecosystem dynamics for creating the deal flow. And then we will begin to solve the problems and also uh, uh, you know, mitigating what could be you know, the arm that we could do at sea and also make the sea safer for human usage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Ruben, and you highlighted uh, in your three key points, I mean, the, the, the need for this whole value chain approach, but also, importantly, being pragmatic and, you know, uh, and bringing that certainty through regulation, uh, for example, on, you know, shipping could could help to kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, accelerate that technology and innovation that you mentioned and, and then bring the funds, as you mentioned, because then, uh, you know, the funds can go where the projects are that, you know, that... Uh, uh, are kind of based on, uh, you know, the regulation and the kind of innovation that is being created through that. So thanks a lot for highlighting that. And actually, you know, you, you raise a couple of important points, which is, which is about, you know, these kind of partnerships and different players coming together, you know, potentially the uh, Europe and China, as well as, you know, uh, you know, different kind of innovators and financiers and so on. You know, you need that kind of partnership and the kind of collaborations between different partners. So, uh, I wanted to talk about that with, 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 with you and the other panelists as well. I mean, obviously at, at Forum Oceano, you have gathered more than 100 members representing all kinds of, you know, sectors of the blue economy. Um, you have also participated in many EU funded projects, uh, accelerators and so on. So collaboration is really at the heart of, of, of your organization. So tell us a little bit more about how best to accelerate collaboration for ocean stewardship. Thank you. Um, regarding, uh, for your question, uh, Martin, so regarding that, I will give the practical example of the project that, uh, EU project that we are co-leading with one of our associates, uh, Betty, it's called the Atlantic Smart Ports Blue Acceleration Network, which has the, the aim to build an EU-wide and transatlantic innovation ecosystem based on ports for accelerating blue startups in all sectors of the blue economy. Uh, we have, so this project now is engaging uh, in, in action 41 ports in uh, distributed among Portugal, France, Spain, Ireland, Norway, Netherlands, Russia, Finland, Canada and um, uh, Mauritania and Colombia. So what uh, uh, the phase that we are now is that we have uh, identified that 90% of these uh, 43 ports that support us directly want and, and their main priority is to become blue economy business hubs in the next five to 10 years. And how we are going to, you know, ignite that, uh, that process. We're going to launch, uh, an acceleration program that's going to be launched next year, uh, in the Athletic Smart Ports Blue Acceleration, uh, network that is to, uh, create a pool of 450 50 startups, which in the end of the acceleration program will be developing 30 pilots in 30 ports of the Atlantic with uh, f uh, private and public financing. So the idea is really to show in all, uh, and these pilots not only will, will some of them augment the ESG performance of the ports and make them smarter, but also prepared for uh, developing the other sectors of the blue economy that uses the ports for their operations, like offshore aquaculture, ocean renewable energies, uh, shipping, and so on. 
So we are now at uh, um, you know starting to devise the acceleration program that will be launched next year if everything goes well between May and uh, May and June. So this is an ecosystem that gathers ports, startups, and creates the deal flow for the investors and the financiers and corporates to have at hand a practical pool of solutions that can be scaled up. So this is a practical example mm -hmm. on how to approach it. And it just could be re replicated in other C basins. That's great, Arun, and it's very encouraging to see, you know, all that collaboration happening. You mentioned, you know, 41 ports participating, 30 pilots and 30 ports. It's super exciting. And you mentioned how kind of global it is. It's not just Europe focused. So um, good good luck with that. It sounds like a great uh, way to kind of collaborate and bring, you know, the different stakeholders together. Um, and uh, just, you know, remaining uh, on the topic of collaboration, I mean, uh, you know, Michael, your research focuses on kind of human ocean interactions, as, as we discussed before, kind of resilience is a key word that comes up in your publications. And uh, what kind of collaborations are required to strengthen community resilience, but also ocean resilience? Do you have examples from your work on in that regard? Yes, I, you know, in the, in the first instance, let me say that uh, the oceans have always been a place where collaboration and cooperation must exist. Um, going back to the earliest days of sea-based trading um, and then all the way to uh, today's world where we see that the, the actions of one party on one side of an ocean can have impacts on communities very, very far afield. So I think there's a very wide recognition of the need to collaborate, and it's a natural thing, obviously, for universities to do. Um, our focus has been on uh, community resilience, uh, community resilience to natural disasters, primarily along the coastal ocean. Um, there are organizations, including the Lloyd's Register Foundation, that have taken a deep dive into this issue and uh, what constitutes resilience, community resilience. Is there such a thing as resilience engineering where we can engineer infrastructure um, in such a manner to be resi uh, resilient to disruption? Um, all of our work, all of my work indicates that the communities are the real source of resilience. And so we, we have to work with communities in terms of education, outreach, giving um, technology, putting technology into the hands of decision makers, policy makers. I think that's an absolute imperative right now. And I'll, I'll end this by just reminding folks when we talk about risk, risk of bad things happening, um, the risk equation is very simple. It's the multiplication of the probability of a bad thing happening times the consequence of that bad thing happening. And so there's two parts to that equation, and we can do a lot to lower the risk to our communities by working on each of them. We can reduce the probability of a bad thing happening by mitigation strategies like carbon capture um, and and other, we've talked about using other sources of fuel for shipping and, and other, other, other uses of fuel. Uh, so those are mitigation strategies. On the other side is adaptation. So we can lower the consequence by, by working with communities to develop adaptation strategies that will, going back to what we spoke about earlier, keep people in their homes, but but do so in a in a safer manner through through adaptation strategies that are informed by by science and data. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for highlighting that. I mean, you mentioned communities are the source of resilience, and and just reminding us of you know the the risk equation, probability times consequence, and also as as you said, you know we we know there are these mitigation solutions out there, carbon capture and so on, and, and we also know that there are adaptation solutions out there and they often come from working with communities as you highlight so that's, that's really important um, and Donette also I wanted to ask you about the you know on this topic of collaboration uh, and resilience and you have been a coordinator uh, and negotiator for the for the government of uh, 
uh, Guyana, of course, in the, in the uh, UN process towards the uh, negotiation of a treaty and the protection of biodiversity in areas uh, beyond national jurisdiction, a very important uh, process that's happening. Uh, it's a complex uh, uh, process, of course. It requires a lot of you know, high level uh, of diplomatic competence and collaboration. Yeah. So how do you see the future of collab collaboration for better kind of ocean stewardship and ocean engineering? And so, thank you, Martin. And my answer to you is really very simple. It is the issue of capacity build and the transfer of marine technology, which is really a very key component. As a matter of fact, it is one of the thematic areas of the BBNJ discussion and one of the more lively areas of discussion. That issue of capacity building and transfer of marine technology to developing um, states. And you know, like Michael said, I wanna refer to something that he said um, just a while ago um, in that what happens on, on one, in one part of the ocean affects some uh, what is happening in another part of the ocean. And so no more can we have, I think the position where states or members of the international community are not collaborating to deal with these issues that affect the ocean. And so um, one of the things, one of the key areas, I think, um, that developing countries have been arguing for, and, you know, we are intending to have a very uh, a robust treaty that deals with this issue of capacity building and the transfer of marine technology. And we are arguing for sustainability. It is not enough for developed countries to come and assist uh, developing countries in terms of the utilization of technology, or it's not enough to, um, to show what is done. But I believe the kind of assistance and the kind of collaboration that is needed is a collaboration that remains sustainable so long after the international partners are gone. The developing country needs to be able to maintain the capacity to deal with its own issues as they come up, you know, and so that continued collaboration. Of course, technology uh, development continues at a rapid pace. And, you know, it is necessary that, you know, that that one part of the international community is not left behind, but that we are all in this together and we're going along together. and as you know, technology develops, innovation continues, that developing countries are, it is, I believe, going to be a little bit difficult at first, but developing countries need to be, you know, I think going right along in terms of, in terms of their ability to use the technology for the benefit, because the benefit, because at the end of the day, it's not just, you know, developing countries that will suffer if, you know, the ocean health continues to deteriorate without um, the matter being addressed. But we are all in the same boat. There's no, um, you know, climate change is happening and, and everyone is affected. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, you know, we're all in the same boat. And so there is need for that kind of collaboration. And I think the good thing is that the international community is aware. So the discussions are happening. They're happening in a very robust way in the BBNJ discussions. And they're happening in other sectors, in other areas, and other discussions relating to ocean health as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks a lot, and for highlighting that. And it's really good to see that, you know, the, the, the BBNJ conversations are continuing despite, you know, uh, you know, the pandemic and, and, you know, the difficulties sometimes, you know, to, to keep these conversations going. But even in this uh, climate, it, it has continued. And you mentioned the importance of capacity building and the transfer of marine technology and the interconnectedness. And, you know, the one of the reasons why it is so important to build that capacity is because of that interconnectedness that you mentioned. Um, and just uh, finally on this on this question of uh, collaboration partners, I wanted to, to go back to Ruth as well. I mean, obviously we have this panel and we all collaborate in one way or another. Uh, and you also mentioned some of the collaborative work that, that you are doing. 
Uh, and of course, you have, for example, foresight review on ocean engineering and so on that are kind of uh, based on collaboration as well. How do you see the kind of the future uh, of collaboration for better ocean engineering? Thank you so much, Martin. There's been so many good things said by my fellow panelists. So I, you know, I, I feel like I can't add too much more to that. But what I would say is, is Lloyd's Register Foundation has, you know, as you mentioned before, funded many projects, tens of millions of pounds over the years from anything from search and rescue to maritime law to how do you build offshore foundations for big infrastructures to so many different areas of ocean engineering that needs now to come together. So this foresight review that we're publishing has, um, is, to, is, a, is reflecting this inflection point. I believe we're at an inflection point where the collaboration must come above everything else. So our foresight review is a call to other people now to come together and to work together, specifically on the areas of ocean engineering. So what are the skills? What are the, what is the engineering skills, the, the planning skills, the marine spatial planning, the legal skills? It was, it's a real multidisciplinary um, group of people need to come together and we need to develop new courses and new education and new skill sets and new capacity that will help us implement good and safe solutions in the ocean. And then the second thing I wanted to highlight was around this need for shared data and shared insight um, that we can all draw down on. And so another thing that um, will come out of our foresight review is something um, we're sort of tentatively calling the Ocean Safety Index. But it, what, it, what we want to do is create indexes which help us, as Michael talked about risk, you know, what are the risks? Where are the places in the world where there are higher risks and lower risks? And where, what are the sectors uh, where there's the right capability, the right engineering, the right technology um, going forward? And that will help the investment go to the right places. So we want to have investment and we want the private sector to be investing in good things. And, and that kind of visibility, that shared data will help that to happen. And the collaborations like the UN Global Compact, which is the private sector, um, the private sector's contribution to the UN goals will help that to happen. So we'll play our role in that. Um, but really, you know, Danette said it all, you know, collaboration is the top of the agenda here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ruth. And uh, you, you mentioned the need to kind of uh, assess those risks in terms of where the investment needs to go. And for that, you need to collaborate. You need shared data and insight. You need to build the capacity. Uh, and as you mentioned, collaborations at the core of, you know, building that kind of capacity in terms of skills, planning, legal skills and so on. Um, we have a bit of time left for uh, the audience questions. Thanks a lot uh, to, the, to the audience for sending these questions in, in advance to the, to the webinar. And I would li just like to ask you to just keep your answers very brief, given given the time constraints. So there's one question here, I think, Ruth, that would be good for you to answer. How can a corporation's legal and governance team make a difference when it comes to ocean stewardship? Oh, thank you, Martin. It's a really good question. I, th I think a lot of us have heard more about the ESG agenda right now. And in corporations, there's a lot more pressure to um, to really consider what what um, the, the uh, impacts on the environment and the impacts on social um, social issues are for any corporation. Now, what I see as part of this inflection point, you know, We've got a good understanding now of carbon and, you know, that we are putting a lot of pressure on reductions in carbon. What I think will come out over the next few years is that the issues that we're talking about, about ocean sustainability and ocean safety, I think these will emerge as much more visible topics. And it will be for those, um, the governance structures of corporations to, uh, if you like, follow that debate as it happens and make sure that there's not a blue washing that happens. You know, you talk about green washing, about taking empty actions. Now we're going to get a lot more actionable insight into actually what we need to happen in the ocean space, what's going to happen in shipping, you know, what's happening in oil and gas, what happens in the food we eat, where are the skills that we need, need, need where, are the, where are the skills that we need? And it's up to those boardroom, those boardroom level conversations to make sure that they are, um, trusted and valued investments, trusted and valued decisions, uh, which are based on good science and good evidence going forward. So um, just keep it real in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks a lot, Ruth. And you, you know, you highlighted this, this need to, uh, you know, to understand these social impacts as well and safety will come to the fore as part of that, because as you mentioned, carbon is already kind of well understood. 
and bringing those skills, uh, you know, uh, the skill sets uh, to the fore in terms of the conversation is really important. There's a question here. Um, I think, Donet, I think this, this could be for you. So this is about, um, you know, where within the priorities of international organizations, such as UNEP, UNDP, uh, the IPCC, does the sustainability and regenerative health of the aquasphere sit? So this is about the prioritization of those international organizations. Um, well, Martin, let me say first, um, it's a very good question. Um, I want to say first that um, states have the primary responsibility to manage those ocean spaces that are within their national jurisdiction. And so to the extent that, and of course there are many, we, we talked about this um, at LIB before, of course there are states that are in a position to kind of fulfill their international obligations. And so in that regard, that is where I think the assistance of certain international organizations like those you mentioned up and so on um, become very, very relevant, become very, very critical um, to the states meeting their international obligations in terms of, of, of I think, um, managing ocean spaces in a sustainable manner. And so I think they, in terms of priority, um, those priorities would necessarily be uh, determined to some extent by the state and the internal organization often will provide the, um, the assistance to the state as necessary as requested. And so, um, and so I can tell you that the emphasis has been on sustainable use and really getting, um, states to understand and to buy into the notion that you have to sustainably utilize your uh the resources within your within your maritime within your uh jurisdiction there's also the issue of areas beyond national jurisdiction that are governed by separate by a separate legal regime but there's sustainable use and then to the extent that the issue generation comes in i think then i think the international organizations will be able to assist states to meet those obligations that mm -hmm. we have under international law. Thanks a lot, Donette, for highlighting that, you know, it's still kind of states that, you know, have this responsibility in the first instant, but there's, of course, beyond national jurisdictions that there is this whole legal yeah. development there. Um, of course, uh, you know, we're kind of running out of time, but um, we have a couple of really interesting questions. So if you could keep your answers uh, brief, that would be great. So here's one for Ruben. Um, the natural carbon capture potential of the ocean already dwarfs anything that human-made future tech, such as carbon capture, utilization, storage could achieve. What is blocking the investment in scale that's needed to support SDG 14 and 15? Uh, great question. Uh, I think the, you know, one obstacle is maritime special planning. So it really has to be, you know, regulated and defined by the, the governments what areas uh, are, can be dedicated to uh, natural carbon capture, capture by seaweed uh, or any other uh, sea foresting? Uh, and also, we have to have more research uh, about uh, what kind of species are really efficient in carbon capturing and also for not doing significant harm. So not to do uh, implement a solution that can create other problems that are not foreseen now. So more deepened research and also better maritime special plan. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, that, that, that's very brief and that's great and very concise. <laughs> uh, research, uh, maritime, uh, spatial planning, great. Um, and then finally, a question here. Michael, if you could keep your answer brief, that would be great. Uh, what are the prospects for human-made coral reefs to strengthen ocean sustainability? So uh, I'm going to try to end on a somewhat positive note. We've, I think we've heard a lot about the challenges. I, uh, I want to recognize that humans have caused great harm to the environment. We know that. But humans have also shown 
a capacity and a capability to uh, to undo um, the harm that we've caused time and time again. And I think uh, with respect to coral reefs, uh, I'm very actually optimistic that human innovation and creativity will show a way. At my university, we are identifying the the reasons why certain individual corals survive major coral bleaching events, whereas their neighbors, their fellow corals do not. And trying to identify what about those individuals makes them more resistant to this human caused uh, problem. And uh, I think that we are on a path to, uh, to maybe help and solve that. And I think that's only one example, but um, I am optimistic that we will be in a position to, to save coral reefs. I really believe that. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, uh, Michael. And thanks a lot for ending on that um, optimistic note. So thanks a lot uh, to all of the panelists uh, for their time. Um, and uh, I just wanted to kind of briefly summarize uh, the conversation. I mean, there's been so many insights. And also thanks a lot to the audience for sending your questions. That has really helped as, as well to kind of bring these kind of uh, intriguing answers uh, to the fore. So first of all, in terms of safety and sustainability, these are really two uh, concepts that belong together. I mean, safety is at the heart of the discussion. Now, you know, we, we talked about ocean careers that need to be safe and uh, not only sustainable. I mean, you can't, you can't have sustainable careers without them being safe. Uh, we talked about the need for digitalization. I mean, uh, uh, Ruben, you mentioned digitalization, decarbonization and circularization, uh, a new term. Uh, it's so really important to look at this kind of uh, uh, full life cycle as well. I mean, accessible, readily available, meaningful data and information was mentioned so that all stakeholders can make informed uh, decisions and choices. Data gathering, really important, uh, knowledge building, uh, transparency, but then also translating that into meaningful decisions. Um, the, the role of maritime law and ocean governance we mentioned, um, not only at the international level, but also, of course, regional and national level. Uh, developing countries, we heard, you know, Donette mentioned that uh, the need, you know, the, you know the, a lot of countries depend on uh, the marine economy and ocean resources. So the sustainable use of those resources is, is vital. Um, you know, we heard about the just transition. Um, you mentioned that, um, you mentioned Ruth in terms of, you know, the ocean dimension. Uh, of, of this kind of just transition, you're looking at ocean-based workforce, for example. Uh, we heard about, you know, from Michael about the kind of the human populations in the ocean, the need to um, to think about that in terms of, you know, turning that awareness to action and business models, uh, you know, looking at kind of shortening supply chains. So it's important to bring the business community into it, uh, but also the catalytic finance that's required in terms of blue finance is required and looking at this as a as an innovation ecosystem and we heard from Ruben a lot about this kind of the need for uh, you know that kind of collaboration between the different players um, there's further reading on all these topics you can see that in, in, under the media player from the world ocean initiative for example and other uh, you know other sources so thanks again uh, to all of the panelists uh, for your time and uh, also our sponsor the Lloyd's Register Foundation stay tuned uh, for the next events in the series on December the 9th uh, we have an inside hour on plastics and circularity closing the plastics loop sponsored by Plastics Europe and also of course the World Ocean mm -hmm. Summit Asia Pacific on December the 6th to the 10th it's a virtual event and then of course our fl flagship event the World Ocean Summit 2022 from the March 1st uh, to March the 3rd in Lisbon, Portugal, an in-person event. We're very excited. Uh, thank you, and we hope to welcome you again soon.